Namaste. My name is Wim Borsboom and I'm very glad to have been invited by Sanjay Sharma from the Eternal Hindu Foundation to give the following presentation. It's titled The Death Knell of the Aryan Invasion Theory. Well, that sounds a bit strong, but I'll try to be gentle. Its topic is about how in the ancient past, Western countries acquired their Sanskrit-based languages. After groups of migrants from Northwest India, the Indus Valley, settled there. But before getting into that, let me first introduce myself. As I said, my name is Wim Borsboom and Yes, that is Dutch, but although I'm originally from Holland, I now live since 1971 in Canada, in beautiful Victoria on Vancouver Island on Canada's west coast. That's Victoria's Parliament building, yes, also very British. No doubt you recognize those architectural features and so many Indian buildings were built in that style during those unfortunate British colonial days. Look at the flowers though, they are of course Dutch tulips and hopefully, in some limited way, they make up for the also not so glorious Dutch colonial involvement in India's past. I am, I should say, a well-traveled independent researcher, an Indophile. Indophile? How come? Well, there is a connection with the town I grew up in, a connection between Delft and India. I come from Delft, the town from where many Dutch East India Company ships sailed to India. To the left, you see the famous painting uh, by Vermeer, of Renaissance Delft with its port from which later many Dutch East India Company ships would sail to India for the spice trade and a thwarted attempt to colonize India because luckily Martanda Varma, who you see in the picture, defeated the Dutch in battle and crushed their Indian expansion, as you see in the photo. As far as Delft is concerned, though, it had a positive side effect, on me at least. On the left, you see the Dutch East India Company, VOC Armamentarium. That's the building that used to store rifles, cannons, explosive powder, gear, etc. in its building. In the center of this picture, you see its heraldic shield, a past that we should not be too proud of. On the right, behind that pillar, you see a building that once was Delft's Ethnographic Museum, a museum that was entirely devoted to Holland's colonial past. The building is now reassigned as we are not too proud anymore of that past. By the way, the Delft Blue pillar is of course Delft's China connection, Delft Blue China. In any case, my dad and I visited it regularly when I was young to watch music and dance performances and listen to folkloric stories from Indonesia and India. So from when I was very young, I must have been about 12 years old, I learned to love India and its ancient culture. Back to this out of India migration theory. Like I said, I'm a well-traveled researcher, but I did not travel as much as India's ancient migrants did, who traveled as much as the chart illustrates, that is, according to my out of India migration hypothesis. By the way, I rather use the word hypothesis than theory. Even the Aryan invasion theory has always been a hypothesis. It was only artificially raised to theory status. In any case, notice the blue, red and yellow lines. Those routes 
I will describe in greater detail later. For now, let's just note that this chart is not the Aryan invasion theory. It's not the theory that states that Aryans from the Eurasian steppe infiltrated India in ancient times, which is, of course, very much disputed nowadays. Apart from some limited alternative proposals, I believe that I'm the only one among Westerners and South Asians to have come up with an extensive, feasible alternative to that Aryan invasion theory. An hypothesis that is entirely based on genetic data, which is ancient mtDNA and ancient Y-DNA, and linguistic data, Indo-European languages. Now, rather than adding more to the debates that promote and dispute the Aryan invasion theory, let's just enjoy this cartoon. Look at that man on that high stool. What's he saying? No AIT. No Aryan invasion theory. What's he doing? He is erasing some red lines and he has reversed the arrows that used to actually point down into India. Look at that man below him. He's walking away with the old sign. Notice a yellow cross across it. Look at the new sign on the right. OIT, out of India theory. And the purple lines along those coasts. Look at the man at the left. He's pointing up. I don't think he likes what he sees. He must be from the old guard. If he just reversed the arrows on those red AIT lines and erase a few, then part of that theory would instantaneously fit, although with lesser importance, into a new out of India theory or OIT. As it is, through my research into European and Eastern history and archaeology, I became a one of only a few Westerners that are helping to disprove, maybe dismantle, that unfortunately persistent, flawed and unproven Aryan invasion theory. Let's focus on the chart to see why it's called a novel out of India migration theory. What is so novel about it? Well, let's follow those lines. We shall start at that swastika in the Indus Valley. That Indus Valley is better identified as the Sapta Sindhu or Seven River Delta. It's the location of the Harappan or Sarasvati civilization or culture. Notice those three colored roads blue, red, and yellow. Do you see that the blue and red follow coastlines and that the yellow lines cross oceans towards the Americas? Well, they pretty well circle the entire globe. So to sum it up for now, we are talking about ancient seafaring, partially land, migrations of Sanskrit-speaking people from the Indus Valley throughout the entire world, while they spread their language worldwide. So seafaring by sea or by land or both, and Sanskrit, more about that later. Look at that, 5,000 year old Indus Valley seals with reed boats. Could those Harappans have used them? Could those reed boats have been seaworthy vessels? Check that prism shaped seal. Check those oars. Check those cabins. And now this picture, that is from Lake Titicaca? What does that have to do with 
the Indus Valley. I wonder where they got their skills from. Remember Thor Heyerdahl with his ocean crossing expeditions, his Contiki expedition from Peru in South America to the Polynesian Islands in the Pacific Ocean with his balsa wood log vessel. Remember his Ra expeditions with a bundled reed vessel. And then most important for this hypothesis is 1977 bundled reed boat Tigris expedition from the river Tigris, of course. So yes, what I propose is that what Thor Heyerdahl attempted to prove and was successful at, that indeed ancient seafaring migrants have done the same. Of course, millennia before Thor Heyerdahl. So you see on the left is map, and of course here is India, here is the Persian Gulf, here's the Red Sea, and on his last trip, the Tigris expedition, where here in Iraq he had his ship built, and later on he sailed down the Persian Gulf, but something happened there. His intention was to go this way, was to go actually to the Red Sea, but when he was at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, the winds were wrong. He couldn't go. He actually was blown the other way, and he went towards, well, he actually ended up in the Indus Valley. He went on land, and he noticed some interesting buildings and he thought they looked like ziggurats and of course he was quite familiar with ziggurats from the Mesopotamian civilization. So he thought hmm, maybe the Indus Valley people at some point had something to do with Mesopotamia. Of course he was right but he thought it had to do with the direction from Mesopotamia to India when I read it in his book, I thought, based on my knowledge that I had in those days, that actually Indian people from long ago had trading connections with the Persian Gulf. In any case, at some point the winds changed again and he was able to take this route and go towards, towards, towards the Red Sea, and he was planning to enter the Red Sea, but this was in the days of the uh, 1978 Suez Canal crisis, and in protest he burned his ship. Let's go back to the story. To the left you see an artist rendering of Mohenjo Daro. At the top center, you see Dr. Kenneryer's depiction of Lothal's seaport. At the bottom right, you see the Sapta Sindhu or the Seven River Delta, and notice that seaport Lothal. So, during the Holocene era, which began at the end of the last Ice Age, about 11,650 years ago, spanning the Mesolithic, Neolithic and Bronze Ages, but specifically over a period between 8,500 and 3,300 years ago, and spreading from the Indus Valley, during the Harappan or Sarasvati culture, in what is now India and Pakistan, multiple parallel and sequential overland and by sea migrations took place, including reed boat faring and later plank boat sailing migrants and their kids, their progeny, who went wave-like, coast hugging, island hopping, land and ocean crossing. Migrations that went more so by sea than over land. While those migrants ceded their Sanskrit language across much of the entire globe.
how did I begin this theory? Well, it actually began as a germ of an idea when I was a 13-year-old inquisitive young lad. Yeah, I kind of looked like that in those days. <laughs> we were still wearing short pants. You see, I had begun to wonder why Dutch, my native language, was considered to be an Indo-German language. Why Indo-German? Should it not be Indo-European? Well, in those days, in 1957, the term Indo-European was only used in Britain, where Thomas Young had come up with the term Indo-European, which is now in general use. But again, why did I wonder about Indo-German? Why Indo? Why German? Well, as a kid even, I used to joke that German was actually a Dutch dialect. Uh, I joked about it because I knew that nobody would take me seriously. Although I had already figured it out that I was right. I was a precautious kid, I'm sure. How I found I was right, I described in that paper that is the basis for this talk. So I won't get into that now. Well, maybe I will. Okay then. First, about pronunciation. And then about etymology. Number one, articulation. When I was 13, I noticed that a visiting German family who came from deep inland rural Germany to visit our country Holland to go to its sandy beaches, how they did not speak my school German or their big city or movie German. They in fact almost mumbled their language. Of course we told them, so they quickly started speaking normal German. But before that, it seemed like they were swallowing their consonants. That made me think. You see, I think I figured out it's all about consonants. You see, sharp pronunciation, articulation, Scottish, Dutch, Italian, all coastal languages and dialects, they are all sharply pronounced. But in the country, inland, in general, as distinct from the cities, people's pronunciation is overall less articulate. When, as I said in general, coastal languages are more articulated. Almost an aha. The real aha came for me many years later, when I was 30 years old, not 13. I had already learned Sanskrit, well, at least I had learned to read it. So it was then that I saw the first connection between Hindi, well, Sanskrit actually, and Europe's coastal languages, Indo-European languages. What, I thought, what if Indo-European meant from India to Europe in the ancient past, along the coast, by boat, not so much over land, but by sea. You see, if it would have all gone over land, if those migrants, so to speak, would go from India to European countries and Northern European countries, then they would have to go from articulate India through consonant swallowing mumbling Central Europe and then to coastal countries where the languages became articulate again. That did not make sense to me at all. Number two, etymology. Did you know that 80%, maybe even more, of all Western languages' words have Sanskrit roots? We all know about mother, father in English, mutter, vater in German, mère, père, French, mater, pater in Latin, and of course, mata and pita in Sanskrit. 
Many years later, when I started reading the works of Sri Aurobindo, after I had learned Sanskrit and had become quite interested in the Harappan civilization, I had gathered enough information to put together a feasible hypothesis, which I first published in 2013 on academia.edu. After a number of iterations and peer reviews by various publications, my paper was most recently, last year, February 2019, presented in New Delhi at IHAR's Indic Chronology Conference at the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts. By the way, IHAR stands for Indian History Awareness and Research, a think tank based in Houston, Texas, in the United States of America. Indian people that are very interested to, so to say, retell the story of India, rewrite the history of India from Indians perspective, the real perspective, not through the glasses of Europeans, Eurocentric views. Let's talk about genetics and language. On this chart, you see purple, light purple, dark purple, increasing in darkness. And the darkest is Iceland, then Scotland, then some European countries. And the more you go towards India and Siberia, it becomes lighter and lighter. Haplogroups are indicated with letters from A to Z. And each group, like haplogroup I or R or whatever, J, W, is a genetic grouping. mtDNA is DNA that was gotten from ancient skeletons, in this case, and it shows genes carried down from mothers to their daughters and sons. Whereas Y-DNA shows the genes that are brought down from father to their sons. Let's discuss the possible correlations between the spread of A, DNA, and B, languages. If you were a Westerner, you'd probably think, and if you were into genetics, you probably would think if anything of these genes would be flowing, they would flow from the darker to the lighter. Europeans or Americans, they were also very Eurocentric. They developed this idea that all culture came from Europe, from maybe Eurasia. But when I started studying this chart, I noticed that this chart showed ancient DNA. What this actually shows more than anything is that in India, in those days, there were much less ancient skeletons that DNA samples could be taken from. Well, from this area, there were more ancient skeletons where the DNA was taken from. So when it shows a darker area, it doesn't mean that there were more people having it. It just meant they have more samples. So I developed the idea, what if we find more DNA here, which now we are doing, right? Different haplogroups though, but that does not really matter. But if you find more ancient DNA, that of course would show a totally different picture. That would mean that the flow of genes would well be going from India, from this area to there or there, or there, or there, and end up in Europe. So this ancient DMA, taken from ancient skeletons, the number that was sampled, showing the light to dark purple, instead of going from up north to down south, it went from down south to the European countries and elsewhere. 
So the genetic evidence, we find that specific sets, haplogroups of empty DNA, and I'll get into why DNA later, that were taken from ancient skeletons that are showing up in Europe, North Africa, Eurasia, Arabian Peninsula, and India combined. Now let's talk about Sanskrit. When we are going by linguistic data, we find that according to up to two and a half thousand years worth of etymological research by Panini and his predecessors, Pindar, Thomas Brown, and recent findings that all Western languages, the whole region in purple and more, as we will see later, use more than 80% of their words that have Sanskrit roots. On the left, the chart is haplogroup I, mtDNA. That is the first group, when I started investigating this, the first data that I found that showed DNA in India and the rest of the world. On the right hand side, you see haplogroup W, mtDNA. Again, this is DNA, mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA, that has been brought down from mothers to their daughters and sons. Now, notice on this side, these darker areas, this one is BMAC, or the Bactrian Margiana complex region then the Yamna culture and the Andronova culture. On this chart, we see more recent haplogroup data. Again, haplogroup I, but it's Y-DNA, so DNA from fathers to sons. This is more recent. This shows that this haplogroup I-DNA happens to be more present in these northern countries. Typically, these countries, the darker areas, their languages have more words that are related to original Sanskrit than the lighter countries. Nevertheless, all these countries, although they pronounce their languages differently, although they sound differently, they are also Indo-European countries, and 80% of their words are also rooted in Sanskrit languages. We saw that top chart before. Afterwards, when the people that were proponents of the Aryan invasion theory, when they saw charts like this, they thought it actually, although the Aryan invasion theory was initially not based on genes, but they saw they thought, well, of course, it went from the darker areas to India. Now, this chart shows that even more. And notice that the Aryan invasion theory is not only about gene flow into India, but also into Western Europe. Again, if you look at this chart, if you just take most of these arrows and turn them around, then you could see that it may well have gone from the Indus Valley to Turkey, to Central Europe, to the rest of Europe. So afterwards, charts like this were used by proponents of the Aryan invasion theory for their stepper theory. Of course, with the interpretation that would support their predetermined and desired conclusions, as shown in the top right chart. At the top, I show a selection of Harappa culture seals, just beautiful. The details. All these seals are about the size of a postage stamp, very small, and they're all intricately engraved with signs and figures and animals. Instead of going into these Indus Valley seals, we're going to talk about this seal. So this 
Bottom left is a Harappa culture seal, but it was not found in the Indus Valley, but it was found on Phylaka Island in the Persian Gulf. More on that later. Now, keeping all of the previous things that we talked about so far in mind, let's now address river, lake and sea navigation with reed vessels by the Harappans. Harappans? Well, Harappans, by the way, is the official archaeologist way to name the inhabitants of the Indus Valley, because Harappa was the first city where ancient ruins were discovered. Hence, the Harappa civilization or culture. So, the bottom left is a seal from Phylaka Island in the Persian Gulf. And to the right you see an ancient reed vessel, of which were remnants found in the Persian Gulf. It's a reconstruction. Now, we can tell from this seal and other Harappan style seals with indescript also found around Iraq and the Persian Gulf, that Harappans lived and traded with the inhabitants who lived around the Persian Gulf and up the rivers in Mesopotamia. About migration though, why would people from anywhere really, why would they migrate? Let's concentrate, especially now, on the ancient migrations from northwest India, from the Indus Valley, the Seven Rivers Delta. It is not uncommon for people to be driven by natural human inclinations to look for other shores, but especially so when they are forced to look for greener pastures because of a number of large natural catastrophes, one being climate change due to the end of the Younger Dryas, Younger Dryas glacial period and other factors which I will address later. In any case now, based on Harappan seals found in the Sapta Sindhu region, as we saw in the previous slide, and Harappan seals found in the Persian Gulf region, we can now show with more and more evidence that these river and lake navigating as well as seafaring Indus Valley boat people migrated in wave-like fashion to a vast number of coastal lands and islands, continents even, I will show that later, throughout the world bringing their languages along. While those migrants and their kids, their progeny, settled in their newly found locations and mixed with the local populations, they introduced their culture, skills, but also their Sanskrit language. Why and what about Sanskrit? Look at these at least 4,000 year old Harappan culture seals. Can they possibly tell us whether the Harappan people spoke Sanskrit? What I found over the last 10 years during my research of Harappan civilization seals was that more than a dozen of well-known story themes from the Rig Veda, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana and the Puranas were depicted on dozens of cartoon-like narrative in this valley seals. You see cartoons, they tell a story, they're narrative. What stories would they be? Here I'm showing just two of those themes on only five seals. This one shows one theme and here is another one and we will get into that. Let's check these five seals. Notice the red circle. That is a tiger. You see this tiger on this seal, on that seal, here as well, 
on this one, notice the yellow circle. It's a bit hard to see, but it's the tree. And you can see a tree here, and there, and there, and there. There are trees here too, but they're different. Look at this black circle, the tiny man. There's a tiny man sitting in the tree. And you see that here, and there, and there, and there. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself, about when I was still the young lad. Remember when I told you about that ethnographic museum in my hometown Delft, where I, when I was 11 or 12 years old, listened to all those Hindu tales? Uh, actually, uh, come to think of it, I also vividly remember a story I saw on TV 64 years ago. There was this wonderful history teller, a Hindu history teller, who came on TV every week and he told us stories about, well, many stories, but there was one particular story that I remembered forever. It was a little boy. He was called Kanta, who, while he was hunting for deer, he himself was also hunted, hunted by a tiger. Anyway, the story goes on, but Eventually, that little boy, uh, while he was chased, he put himself into safety and he climbed a tree and overnight he was sleeping in the tree. I actually forget what happened after, but that's what I clearly remember. Now, when so many years later, uh, when I saw these seals, I remembered that story, but also I knew by that time that there was a similar story in Sanskrit literature, in one of the Puranas. So I looked it up. That story was about Lubdaka. You know that story. It's a well-known Mahashivaratri story that many people tell to their kids during those festivals. Remember, it's about a guy who was hunting deer, and while he was hunted, he got hunted by a tiger and was chased and he ended up in a tree and in safety and while he was in that tree overnight it became rather dark and cold he was shivering and shivering and uh, because of his nervousness he started picking leaves and he dropped them to the ground anyway it became colder and colder but by the next morning sunrise it became lighter and lighter and he looked around and oh and no tiger so he thought it was clear and he climbed down and he saw that the leaves had been dropping were scattered around a big rock anyway while he was looking at that rock and those leaves he heard a growl and oh my gosh he looked behind him and he thought he thought it would be a tiger but no, there was Shiva. I'm telling it in my own words, of course. And Shiva, Lord Shiva, the tiger had changed into Lord Shiva. And Shiva said to him, Lutaka, you have dropped those beautiful leaves, my favorite leaves, bal leaves. You dropped them and look how they're circled around my favorite stone, the lingam. You are a special guy. They talked some more and he said, you know what, I will grant you liberation, Moksha. Of course, Lubdaka became enlightened and was very happy. Now about the other story, this one. There is one person stretching his arms between two men both of them holding an uprooted tree. It reminded me about how Krishna, while well, he was trying to escape from his mother's care, uprooted two trees by accidentally pulling them over with his mom's churning apparatus. 
uh, that from those trees two people emerged Nala Kuvara and Manigriva. Remember they had been cursed by the sage Narada for their naughty behavior, their wantonness. Krishna pulling those trees over, they, they were delivered from their curse by Krishna. So again, another story, the Pyrrhagon seals that were most likely predating the orally transmitted and later written down Sanskrit accounts. Could it be that the language the Arabians spoke was indeed Sanskrit. Well, according to my discovery, as detailed in my book Skanda, an ancient god rediscovered, they did. Incidentally, if you're interested, you can find a preview of that book on academia.edu. It's also extensively documented on the Facebook page that I run in this valley culture. Decipherment? Yes, there is actually a decipherment. A translation and interpretation of those seals. There is one by the anthropologist Mrs. Sue Sullivan, who wrote a book in the script dictionary. A fantastic work with thousands of seals. Their script deciphered and interpreted based on Sanskrit. And, this is interesting, her translations, of which at the time I didn't know, lined up with my findings. Independently, we came both to the same conclusions. Not a Rosetta Stone, of course, which had different languages, but we came from two directions. I, for argument's sake, came from Paris, she came from California, and we both ended up in the Indus Valley. Interesting that we found the same idea, that the Indus Valley people must have spoken Sanskrit. We can now with confidence say that Sanskrit, at least in early form, was indeed the language spoken in the Sapta Sindhu Delta. So altogether then, that there is DNA evidence showing that the Arapan genome spread from the Indus Valley to at least Europe, that at least European lands migrated into by early Arapans and their later progeny spoke Indo-European, that the Indo part of those languages is surely etymologically rooted in the Sanskrit language, and that the narrative cartoon-like seals from the Santa Sindhu Delta, from where the migrants originated, could be deciphered, translated, and interpreted based on subsequent Sanskrit stories as found in classic ancient Indian literature. That brings me to the conclusion that the European culture migrants spoke Sanskrit. Well, the Harappan civilization migrants and their progeny traveled to farther shores and landed and settled in various places throughout. Over time, their Sanskrit tongue and their and the local tongues spoken by the various indigenous people who inhabited the European islands and coastal areas, they intermixed. They formed various dialects, which dialects eventually and over time developed into that large variety of classic and current Indo-European languages. By the way, in addition, these seafaring and island hopping migrants also left Sanskrit remnants of their language on the Atlantic Ocean's archipelagos, which influenced the Malayo Polynesian languages in the Pacific Ocean. 
There is a study detailing it to, uh, titled East Indian Influence in Polynesian Culture by my good friend Ushi Rinleip, which you can also find on academia.edu. Let's focus now on the three main roads. Now that we have provided these interesting ancient DNA data and Sanskrit evidence, we can now focus on those voyages taken. As shown earlier on, I've indicated three of those routes, which time-wise occurred in wave-like fashion, both sequentially and in parallel matter. And they all emanated from this point here in the Indus Valley. These ventures began quite early on, spending millennia between 8,500 and 3,300 years ago. Initially, it were adventurous and greener pastures seeking inhabitants from the Seven Rivers Delta, whose ventures may initially just to be normal, natural human exploits. But as I said before, they were together with trade, as you could tell from the seals found in the Mesopotamian area and from around the Persian Gulf, they were also driven by natural calamities, droughts, flooding, tsunamis, earthquake, famine and diseases. We should keep in mind, and it's important that we do, that those river valley inhabitants were already river and lake navigation savvy. They were regular fisher people, land people, farmers, herders, agriculturalists. They were skilled crafts, potters, skilled in metal crafts, melting, jewelry. Let's go deeper into Route 1. Imagine now that we are her rapid. We from the Indus Valley, let's say from Lothal or maybe even Dwarka, is that submerged city that has been found lately deep under the ocean. And we are taking our reed vessels and we go sailing, shore hugging. We safely follow the coastline. Luckily, we have the wind with us, the prevailing seasonal winds, and we go westwards along the coast. First, we go south along Baluchistan, then along the coast of Iran, and we go towards Iraq. We stay there for a little while, and we go back again and we circle around the Arabian Peninsula. Then we sail through the Red Sea and we are going to sail through the Mediterranean Sea. But wait, that, that's interesting. By the way, before we get into that, let's not forget our people who prefer journeying overland who did not mind being challenged by treacherous mountain passes like the Khyber Pass, for example, and the Caucasus Mountains. Large groups ended up east and north of the Caspian Sea, settling there, and their offspring going further into the Russian steppe. Other groups, after having gone up the rivers of the Mesopotamia areas, and they crossed the Caucasus and they arrived on the shores of the Black Sea. They settled there and their offspring going further into Central Europe. Other groups again, over time, they ended up in Anatolia with their skills, pottery and metalwork, chariot building, horse riding, agriculture, and husbandry. Remember, after we went further on up the Red Sea, we ran into, well, we should have run into, well, we didn't, 
into the Mediterranean. If you wonder how that was possible, the area where the Suez Canal Zone is situated was at times quite navigable. On the left you see the Suez Zone, as it was before the Suez Canal was constructed between 1959 and 1969. You notice here the Red Sea, the Suez area, the Mediterranean. This actually was always navigable, sometimes difficult because of the tides and the flow of the water, but maybe not as much. But there were times that it was extremely navigable. How do we know that? Well, look at this chart. There are many more charts like this lately, but this was the first one I found when I started investigating this theory. This chart, it shows sea level data from 140,000 years ago to current. And notice here, it's very low, it went higher up, and there were many, many ice ages. The sea levels went up and down. And here, about 20,000 years ago, that was that a younger, driest glacial period. At the end, the ice started melting and sea levels went up. And it went to about zero here, where it is our current level. But when we look at this area here, and I enlarged it, you see there's this gray line. Notice the arrow. There is a gray line. And if you look very carefully here at the dates, during those days, the sea level may well have been from 6 to 10 meters higher. That, of course, allowed easy sailing to the Mediterranean lands including Northern Africa, through what you could call the Suez Canal, or maybe even the Strait of Suez. Of course, it must have had a different name then. Let's go back to the route that we took. However it was, after we settled on the coastal lands around the Mediterranean Sea and its many islands, from Egypt to, oh, by the way, I should mention that beyond Egypt, reed was not available anymore. But as we went on, we invented stitched wood board vessels, which incidentally kept their typical shapes. Remnants that have been found, and here is one of them found in Oman, now, interesting that the ships that we later on built, they kept their shape. They kept their double bowed or proud shaped. And they are still retained in, let's say, Venetian gondolas and Viking ships. See, one prow, another prow. You see that ship. And here you see a gondola. And here you see the Viking ship, and they both had these prows. We travel from Egypt to North Africa, to the west, but also from Egypt to the Levant, where now Israel is. And we travel to the Turkish coast. We traveled to Greece, Macedonia, Croatia, Italy, southern France, and then eventually we go through the Gulf of Gibraltar, we circle Spain, and we go up to northern Europe, in Bretagne, in France, the North Sea coastal lands like Scotland, Ireland, Britain, and from there we go to Denmark, the Scandinavian lands, the Baltic Sea's coastal areas, and eventually Lithuania, where their language is now still very close 
to Sanskrit origins. All those areas that I mentioned here, as we have seen, they still have the DNA traces from Indian ancestors. And now specific languages such as French, Italian, German, Dutch, etc., as they gradually develop from their Sanskrit mother tongue, we should realize that where migrants landed and settled, the local population was in general not so large. So the influence of indigenous languages was probably less than we think. The red line. So overland within India now. In India, also migrations took place. So that was after the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization, around 1300 years before the current era. The migrants went to North India, Northeast India, the Ganga area, Central and Southern Indian regions, where they merged with existing indigenous populations and cultures. They also sure huggingly oversee migrated around the coast of India and areas like Calcutta. And according to the latest findings, even according to a paper from about a year ago, they ended up in Australia. Notice they must have gone via Indonesia or probably some other parts of these archipelagos and ended up in Australia, where also Indian DNA was found. Of course, in more recent historical eras, classical eras, especially under Emperor Ashoka, migrations were also taking place. And furthermore, under subsequent more recent leaders, they were, and we still are. Our offspring went further east over sea through the peninsula of Malaysia, where now Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka is. They went further up Central Asia, but also the Pacific coastal lands and archipelagos. And eventually, they also, via some islands here and there, they ended up in the Americas, Central America, and in Peru. You remember I first showed this picture about Peru, Lake Titicaca, and I wondered where those people learned their skills. Well, there was wheat there, so perhaps when those early Harappans arrived there, they remember that and they introduce those skills. In closing, let me again thank Sanjay Sharma from the Eternal Hindu Foundation for sponsoring this talk, but also various colleagues, universities, museums, publishers and organizations in Bhopal, Nagpur, Varadasi, Kolkata, Pune, Bangalore, Chennai, New Delhi and Houston. Those were the places that I visited during a 20 venue tour. As well as many of my dear friends in New Delhi, Kolkata and especially a good friend in Connecticut, USA. They never held me back. And of course, a very special thank you to my wife, Emmy, who so well supported me with this project while I was so often abroad or hooked up to my computer and smartphone. So thank you all. Danny Avad. <laughs>